So uh, Gertz and I had the opportunity to go to the JD.com Global Robotics Challenge, which is a mobile picking challenge. There were 10 teams, eight of the teams were from China through a, a calling of 100 uh, teams, and then two international teams, the Malaysia team uh, from Nanyang, and our team. And so we went, we got there about uh, the 12th, and we left on the 19th, and between that I think we slept. <laughs> Who's that man? <laughs> yeah, well, sure. not a lot. Lots of 20, 22-hour days. Uh, and so were the rest of the team. So this is a really uh, high level of development going into the end. Who made that base <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> so you'll notice here there's a ubiquity base. There's some fans in here of that. <laughs> we own two so far. So uh, that awesome base totally made our day. What? Would you recommend it to your friends? I recommend it to everybody. So we're, we're starting to build out on it. So this is uh, at the challenge. We had uh, six days. Uh, JD.com. Uh, JD.com is Amazon of China. It's third largest internet company in the world. They put us up in a building that was bought from Motorola Paging in Tianjin. And what was interesting about that is this Motorola Paging used to be enormous, an amazing company way back when, and this was one of their factories, and it is a huge factory that was derelict. Uh, JD bought it, and they had us use it, and nobody else was in there. They had guards at the station. This place hadn't been cleaned up, and we were in one of the rooms of this place. The room was 140 yards by 35 yards. I think it was, <laughs> it was enormous. They had us in one end. It was lit in our end, it was dirty, the floors were dirty, the bathrooms were broken. That's where we lived until the day before the competition. Everybody had to take their robots down, take them over to this place, which was the arena at the University of Tianjin. And uh, then we set up there, had a, um, a night to kind of get it all working. And the next day they had an enormous event. They had uh, big video, big sound, they had robot people dancing. It was super focused on young people to attract people into what they were doing. We had three judges, uh, Andre K, and then two people uh, from JD or something, not quite sure who they were. But this is a robot, and this is going around the challenge, and the robot recognizes from a pick list that we were given ahead of time what objects that we want to pick. It picks them, it takes it back, and it dumps it, and has to do that in six minutes. Now this team over here was actually, they, they were from a poor university, but they had a beautiful little robot, but it was, it was really unreliable. And the problem they had was they were completely dependent on Wi-Fi. They got into this arena and Wi-Fi didn't work for them. So they were completely out. It was a bummer for them. So it was a nice and elegant little design. This one you can see going and picking. It picked up a lipstick. It can pick up all different types of things there. At the end of the day. Is this being up or this is a This is automatic. So this is all auto picking. All autonomous. Yeah, this is all autonomous. Gertz did all the programming on this. Gertz. Here we go. In the competition, uh, we only have two cameras on here. There's one in the front right here, which Gertz is using for uh, navigation around the arena, and it's literally going point to point. It wasn't even a visual slam. And then the other one is on the gripper, so it's, he would move up to a uh, one of those tables for picking and go along and look at the objects as we went along, got to the end of the table and moved to the next one. And so uh, had a, uh, you're inside the robot now, get the robot. Now I heard you only had one run? We only had one run and so the trick was, so uh, Andra K announced that we got third place and God bless her, I love Andra. It's actually fifth place, but the thing that they gave Kurt. us is labeled as third tier, so we were paid out third tier, but was actually fifth place. Now, on the flip side of that, if we'd recognized every object that was our weak point, we would have won the whole thing. It would not have been a problem. All other robots that competed and got to the end all had to be interrupted, and stopped, and restarted. That was not our problem. We couldn't recognize the object, so if we restarted, we still wouldn't have gotten everything. <laughs> 
Uh, but we did well. It was, uh, we had the best robot for production. It is reliable. We didn't have to do any work on it basically the whole time there, and everybody else was developing robots. Uh, eight of the ten robots were big robot, or seven of the robots were big robot arms and big bases. Uh, the, nine of the teams had good uh, machine learning image recognition working. Not ours. Uh, but as you went around, Gertz is looking at the objects in profile, and the 3D gives you the profile of it. From that, we were able to select the objects. There were three objects that were uh, the same profile in our pick list, a tall Pepsi, a shampoo, and a clear gel. So when we saw what we thought was a Pepsi, which we needed to get, we then asked it what color is it, and it would be blue. We knew it was a Pepsi, so we picked the Pepsi. Um, what was funny is, every now and then it would reach out and it would grab this blue yeah. bar. <laughs> right? The robot would go by and it would go, there's something, and grab the bar and it <laughs> Unless the ripper comes back, it thinks it's not done. So Gertz goes and it happens three times, right? He's not sure if the whole thing's going to fall over the robot's going to fall over. <laughs> so Gertz gets inside the robot and watching it goes, lipstick. <laughs> right? So we look at the profile. <laughs> And it turns out, go by one of those little tiny slots, and we see that little slot, and it was the same profile as a lipstick, and it stopped there and picked that whole blue thing as a lipstick. <laughs> so we did a color check after that, and that solved that, but it screwed us up on the day of the competition. So, so that translated to real money, though. Uh, translated to real money, but let me tell you a couple of tricks on real money from China. <laughs> <laughs> Number one is that's RMB, right? So that's seven to one for dollars. Number two is they tax it on the way out 20%. <laughs> so we get $14. Yeah, we don't get a lot. It's like $17,000, $18,000. So last time we were here, Oh yeah, we're, yeah, we're, yeah we're, we're, we had a lot of fun. So let me see other other interesting things on this. So I, I'm going to just tell you some more stuff. So we're building our second robot of this. This is actually landed in a place coming back. We've ripped off what we had on there, which is vision based. We put on lidar, and uh, one of the amazing things of this competition is JD.com assigned an executive to us as a coach, and so they picked an executive from their supply chain. We got the senior VP of research and development at Keon Group. Keon Group bought Domatic. Domatic makes all the sorters of Amazon and JD.com. Uh, he thought what we were doing was disruptive. So they invited us to go to Vienna, Austria to demonstrate this to their top 450 executives. Ooh, all right. yeah. so, really so in, in the process of doing that, um, we, we linked up with another little organization locally called the Kiro. We put LiDAR on top of it, and now we're automatically picking. We have uh, slots all around, and the demo's off. The robot shipped yesterday morning again. And it, in a picking thing with all these shelves and slots, comes up with random order, goes around and picks them, comes back, dumps them, and it will run all day long. <laughs> if, it, if it runs at all. <laughs> and this project also benefits by the unique and marvelous gripper design. Yep. So that, that's that's what's making that aspect of it. So, so that's to 450 of their top execs. That's in two weeks. So I was going to show you kind of what they're interested in. Gertz is going through this. I was going to throw up some slides of kind of where this is going. Did you have more stuff you want to show or tell them down? Yeah. All right. So I had... Uh, Afterwards, they had lots of TV and stuff like that. I had Gertz give an interview to the Chinese television. <laughs> Wait, he talked? <laughs> he did, he did, and it was beautiful. Because uh, as I talk all the time, that's easy. Yeah. Spew comes out. But they, they turn, they ask Gertz something, because we're standing here like this, right? We're in our shirts, and we're doing the whole thing. They ask uh, Gertz about the competition. Well, what did you think about the competition? <laughs> it was well run. Yeah, uh, yeah, just a few things. It was perfect. I was like, yes. And then, and then people were coming around saying to the other teams, they said, "You guys are going to be famous." The girls are going to be famous. <laughs> In China. In China. <laughs> uh, 
All right, so I was going to show you just a couple of slides of where this is going, because it's kind of fun. I'm going to try and show you a couple of slides. <laughs> All right, I got three slides for you. Uh, this is the beginning of a really good presentation someday. So our motto was low cost, fast, reliable mobile picking. And we think we can deliver that. And that's unique in the industry right now. It does not exist in anything that's cost structure and reliability wise good. And the interesting thing is, if you look at a Kiva robotic system, it's bringing the shelves to pickers because the dexterity required is high. Oh, actually, let me go through a couple things here. I'll just show you this. So right now, in the process of stuff coming to your house, it goes through picking, manual picking, like 60 to 200 lines per uh, hour. Uh, Kiva brings that up to six, 800 lines per hour. 80% um, of the orders are from 20% of the stock. But the fundamental thing is, uh, picking is evolving. It starts from Kiva brings shelves to pickers because humans are great at picking. Now they're starting to automate the picking, bringing the uh, shelves to robot arms. What flips that is if you get dexterity that can be mobile, now you can swarm robots into the inventory and get rid of the human part of that. And a big uh, series of shelves going to every picker gets inverted. That's what that starts to look like. So the high volume part of the factory, you start uh, Kivas, start maintaining the shelf stocky, and then the robot pickers swarm in there, go up, and there's a pattern to it and stuff, and pick out of that. And this is where human pickers are for items, and this can start off swarming. And then as more items can get successfully picked, that can increase. That's the vision. Someday. And these are little ubiquity robots going on your conveyor. <laughs> so those are the slides. That was it. Okay, what's booting here is NVIDIA's TX2 development cord, which Yay. I recently got, and a lot of people are playing with it because it's fun. Fun. There's one. So uh, this is going to be really quick. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah Half fast, we can't afford. Yeah. Is this Watson's arm? So Watson, there is no more Watson. Watson has been replaced by Karen. For those oh, here. That, I'm sorry. Uh, uh oh. Wrong button. Not How do I get back out of that, guys? I'm not uh, control C. Control C, of course. Why not just control on delete? E space. C. And one more. C D to release. So you can you can uh, write programs on a development Linux system and then you sort of download them on here. And and now we're in the right direction. Okay, so this is one of Karen's legs. I ripped it off for those that saw Karen before. Karen could not do this. So standing up was a problem along with walking. But Karen can now do that. And this is the new Karen mechanics. So it goes all the way up and all the way down. But what's really the critical part of this recent rebuild besides the, uh, the NVIDIA board, is that I now have motor control. Instead of PWMing, RC PWMing for position control and you get there, there actually is a Palolu board inside here that is not completely brain dead and will pass the potentiometer feeding back out. And that's really crucial because it broke a lot of mechanisms when the unit would turn on and it didn't know where it was and it would try to move and things would go. Oh. 
So what, what I'm going to show you now is um, the, one of the, there's two main things for balancing besides things go on the table. One are load cells at the bottom. These are precision load cells. There's four on the, on the uh, square on the bottom. And uh, we read those and we get a center of mass. And that center of mass is real important because every time the robot steps, the mechanics are so sloppy, the center of mass is somewhere else. So if you're using some sort of frame driver or, or you've done some simulation, in the real world, it's not going to work. It's going to need some kind of dynamic correction. And that's what the load cells do, along with the IMU. So the first step was to um, get the information over to something less primitive than what I was using, which is why I'm using that. And now we're going to turn it on and just hope it works. Stop moving. If I could type. It's hard to type when you're not really. Oh, wait a minute. Dot slash. Sorry, guys. Reach away from trouble. Oh, come on. All right, let's do this without looking at it. Dot slash. C I one. Right? Of course. So I'm going to shut power it off actually for one second and redo it. And the reason is is because it's going to auto calibrate the load cells. The load cells, when they turn on, read so the weight. And so you sort of have to. You try to turn it on off again. Uh, oh, you know what? I'm being stupid. You have to restart that. It doesn't really care what the robot's doing. Are we on? We are off. We are on. And so it's going to go through a, an auto tear. Uh oh. And then I might have missed the first packet, so it might have not paired correctly, but let's see. Uh, that is incorrect. It should be about 12 pounds, so that's incorrect. It's just run it one more time. Chris, would you mind doing things so I can do both at the same time? Yeah. Now just hit it. Just merely yeah, hit it. Yeah. Well, well done. done. Well done. <laughs> one gem. <laughs> Lost bites are okay. I don't know why we get those time to time. It drops bites. It doesn't do it on the PC. It only does it on the Linux system. So, okay. So now. As I move the, the weight around, you're going to see the cubes sort of move around. If I push here on the toe, it's going to go down there. If I push on this toe, it's going to go down there. If I push back on the heel, and it's going to go back there. So the idea here, I don't blow anything up, is that as the leg, don't break on me. Come on, be nice. The problem is, is that I don't want to move the controller around, but what's going to happen is, is you'll see that, and I'm only doing it once every two seconds now, so we're going to speed the rate up to about ten times a second, and it will just always calculate the center of mass and be able to make slight corrections so that when it stands on one leg, it's within the center of mass. And then as we want to do something more dynamic and walk outside the center of mass, we'll just throw the center out. So, so that's... That's the, uh, the new rebuild. Okay, thank you. It's a really big one. Not least smaller. Pardon? 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 Hey, look at this. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Somebody has a 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has a nice 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> Can I crawl over here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it can. <laughs> it can actually crawl over things, but not the on the table next day. They are a little bit too high and it's too hard. Come out. Also, is, yes, it's pretty blended. Right now, it's an expensive RC car. It's using 
the cheek, uh, Chinese dynamics are knock off servos as turn uh, servos in four uh, SMPs as well as uh, drive motors. So, but that might actually change because it has a major problem. I do not get uh, encoder readings out of those servers. So, of course, it's kind of out of the question right now. But motors with encoders are on order. Uh, let's see when I get them. So, that, that's one thing. Mostly pretty blended. And yeah, some metal parts, many screws. And the other thing I wanted to bring is basically one of the fancy uh, GPS setups. That's actually the first relatively cheap uh, two frequency GPS unit I found. So those are the new U blocks CEDF. 9F, I think, is, is the name. So they are dual frequency receivers. That's actually a pair to be uh, to do real time kinematics. And What's good about them? Uh, what do you get with dual frequency? Better accuracy. So you, you can actually calculate more of the atmospheric. Uh, disturbances out of the uh, perceived timing signals, essentially. And real-time kinematics gives you, they claim, below centimeter accuracy. So, and that was before one of those was basically a thousand dollars. Now I got two plus the dual frequency antennas for, I think, 400. So, yes, it's <laughs> coming down. So that's pretty much it. Mm. And yes, that little rover was all around the bay so far, and it's continuing to go around and have fun. So, so like when you're Amtec, you had the, uh, pick, the Pixie Hawk? Yes. Did you use that same sort of thing here? In the on, on this one right version. now, it's, it's basically a Raspberry Pi reading the RC signal and talking serial to the servers. But yeah, all the other stuff can come once I basically know how far I jump. <laughs> and that's, that's currently the limitation. Yeah. Um, clock up here says 824, so we'll meet back at 830.